to everyone. I'm uh, very pleased today to, to have uh, this presentation about uh, one of the latest reports from the Center of Economic Policy Research. And uh, we have two of the authors here, uh, our senior scholar, Andre Sapir, which uh, most of you know, as well as uh, um, Guido Tabellini, which most of you probably know as well. He is uh, Intesa San Paolo professor of political economics at the Bocconi University in Italy. Uh, he used to be uh, uh, the rector of, uh, of the Bocconi between 2008 and uh, 2012, if I'm correct. Among other things, he has been uh, to Stanford, he has been at the USL, USLA, uh, he's a member of uh, the Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, in, uh, in the US, um, and many other things. So we are very honored to have, uh, to have Guido uh, to be one of the presenters today of, um, of this report, which comes uh, at a very timely moment. Obviously, the uh, debate around uh, the state of trust in the EU, it's something that, especially here in Brussels, uh, it's kind of bread and butter of, uh, of the past few years uh, of debates, papers, and, um, and discussions. Uh, but especially in this moment, I would say it's, it's particularly interesting to, uh, to see this report, which uh, establishes some uh, in-depth research. Uh, first of all, because the score of populist parties uh, shouldn't be underestimated, even if, uh, as we've seen in the, in the past election in France, in the Netherlands, uh, some of the worst case scenarios have been avoided, but let's not forget about uh, the fact that those, those parties are still very strong in most of, uh, of the countries. Let's not forget, for example, the score of uh, the Front National in France. And just to mention something that is upcoming, uh, uh, the German elections, we shouldn't, uh, uh, under, uh, over, um, uh, we shouldn't underestimate the score that um, IFD might have on, uh, on Sunday. Uh, but also it's the moment where we are more speaking about reconnecting citizens to the EU. I mean, we uh, heard uh, Macron's speech uh, in Athens a few weeks ago. We heard the echoes at Juncker's speech, and uh, there is enough time now to really plan ahead. It's really a crucial strategic moment. The European elections are in 2019. We are, we are at the right moment to uh, seriously not only make an analysis of the situation, but also propose some policy challenges. And uh, on this note, I really give the floor to our um, our uh, uh, presenters to, to start their, their presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe. Uh, thanks for the uh, introduction. So we will make a presentation for uh, about uh, 30 minutes, and then uh, we'll have Maria uh, give us comments, and we look, uh, we look forward to, uh, to that. So let me uh, give a, a little bit of, uh, of background. Uh, I, uh, I just need to move forward. Uh, yes. OK. Yes. So let me give you a little bit of background uh, on, the, uh, on the study. Uh, we started to do the work uh, on this a year ago. Uh, I think the timing is important. Uh, a year ago means after Brexit, uh, and it was just after the election of Trump. Uh, in the uh, in the United States, before the election in uh, in the Netherlands, before the election in uh, in Austria, before the election in uh, in France, and certainly the mood then was fear that the wave of populism uh, that had you know gone through the UK, then the US, would come to continental Europe. So that was the background, and we decided we needed to do work on this subject from an economic viewpoint, but an economic policy viewpoint uh, on, uh, on populism. No, populism is, is, hard, uh, is hard to define. Uh, there is a lot of literature, obviously, in the political science uh, discussion on what is populism, and we put forward here some elements that are common in all of those definitions. It's usually sort of pitting the common people versus the elite. It's uh, typically sort of putting forward uh, radical, sometimes simplistic policy solutions, and it's very often as sort of a, a connotation of, of nationalism, sometimes even of protectionism. 
So, but still to measure it, it's not very, very easy. So what we decided to do, which we thought was in a sense, the, the fundamental element here is, is trust and trust in institutions, trust towards European institutions, trust towards national uh, institutions in the uh, member states uh, of the European Union. And we wanted to check how trust uh, has evolved uh, over time and how uh, populism, however being measured, and we will discuss that, how populism and trust relate uh, to one another. And our assumption being that one of the reasons for this wave of populism was the fact that there's been a weakening uh, of trust towards, uh, towards uh, institutions. Now, you can say, well, this is an issue, and I just said that it's just not a European issue, it's also an issue uh, that we have in the United States. We decide to focus on, on the EU first because we are Europeans, but not just for that reason. The, the, there is, I think, a specific reason that we believe that, in a sense, all of the factors uh, that we have put forward here in this slide that, you know, characterize uh, populism uh, are elements that characterize anti-EU feeling, uh, this notion of common people versus the elite. The EU project is typically accused of being an elite project. The EU project is by essence uh, a supranational, uh, not a nationalistic uh, protectionist project, it's an open uh, supranational project. So to the extent that there is populism, I think one can expect that one of the targets would be the EU. And that's the reason uh, fundamentally why we wanted to, to look at this issue, thinking that you know, if indeed there is a further rise of populism and uh, lack of trust in Europe, uh, the first target uh, would be the European Union and therefore the European Union would be at risk. So this is really what we started to, to study. Is the EU at risk? because of the rise of populism, because of a decrease of trust in Europe. So the way we'll do the, the presentation, uh, Guido will do most of, of, of the presentation, we'll take it from, from here, and then I will come back at the end with some of the uh, policy uh, implications. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is the outline that uh, the report uh, follows and I will follow in the presentation. I will describe briefly the data sources. Uh, then uh, I will show you some correlations to convince you that populism and trust uh, are highly correlated. Uh, and then we analyze uh, the, the trust data, the survey data and uh, uh, data on electoral outcomes and then I will give again the floor to Andre to conclude. So uh, we use two data sets. We mainly focus on uh, the EU15 countries. The first data set is uh, a survey data from the European Social Surveys. These are uh, done every two years in uh, each of these uh, countries. Uh, between 2002 and 2014, and from this survey we take uh, two data that we use as, uh, as a dependent variable. One is a declaration of how individuals voted in the last national election, uh, and the other are trust attitudes towards uh, uh, national parliaments uh, or European and the European Parliament and attitude towards uh, European integration. I should say that um, the focus on the national parliament uh, um, is, uh, should be taken as a synonymous of national political institutions. Uh, this na trust towards national political institutions is highly correlated if you, if you look at different uh, institutional dimensions. The second database is uh, instead the, the uh, European election outcomes. These are available uh, for us in, uh, at the regional level. Uh, between 1999 uh, and uh, 2014, uh, and the dependent variable is the vote share in these uh, uh, elections to the European Parliament of uh, parties that have been classified on the dimension of how pro or against Europe they are. 
this uh, classification is done by uh, experts, national experts. The source, the source is the Chapel Hill Expert Survey, uh, and uh, we look at the vote shares of anti or pro EU parties in uh, uh, in, in in this period, uh, and we match these uh, also match these. Uh, data at the regional level with the uh, uh, macroeconomic regional outcomes, unemployment and GDP per capita. The idea being that we want to exploit the fact that the, there were idiosyncratic regional shocks. Some regions were hit harder than others, and this gives us an opportunity to see if there are correlations uh, with the political or, or survey data. Uh, so the first question is uh, uh, whether there is a correlation between how you behaved as a voter in the last uh, national election uh, and uh, uh, these uh, survey uh, attitudes, uh, this trust in uh, European or national <coughs> political institutions. Here, the analysis covers uh, uh, about 22 countries, so not just the EU 15, but also Eastern Europe and Central Europe. Um, and the Populist Party definition here is based on a traditional definition in political science uh, used in this paper by Ingle Hart and Norris. And uh, the main finding is uh, that indeed uh, populist voters have less trust in uh, national and in uh, European Parliament and are more skeptical uh, towards the uh, European Union. So uh, here you see this correlation controlling for individual features like age, education, gender, uh, and the country near fixed effects. And uh, uh, so on the horizontal axis, you have trust in the national parliament, in the European parliament, and uh, towards European integration. And on the vertical axis, uh, you have the fraction of respondents who declare to have voted for one of the populist party in the last national election. And uh, the dots have been aggregated to reduce the dispersions in the observations, and you see a very stark uh, negative correlation. Uh, populist voters uh, are less trusting of national political institutions and of uh, the European integration. Uh, then we turn to an analysis of, uh, motivated by these findings, we turn to an analysis of these uh, trust attitudes. Uh, here, the analysis covers uh, only the EU15 from here on. And the first thing that uh, you see is a general decline in trust towards the European Parliament. So here, the top left graph gives you a weighted average of uh, the responses throughout uh, the sample where uh, the weights are population weights. Um, and so you see a generalized decline in uh, trust over time, which uh, uh, is pretty general. Um, there are a few exceptions. Sweden is a glaring exception. Belgium is another one. Um, Germany fluctuates, but uh, in most countries, uh, trust towards the European Parliament went down, particularly in the more recent period. Bear in mind that some countries uh, don't cover all the data, in particular Italy and Greece uh, don't have data for 2014. Uh, uh, next, uh, we look at uh, uh, national uh, parliaments, trust towards national parliaments. Here, too, we see a decline uh, overall, but the decline is a bit less uniform. and. Uh, uh, if you look at this picture, you see that the trust towards national parliament declined particularly in the countries that were hit by the Great Recession uh, in Germany and some of the northern European countries instead trust towards national parliament went up or did not, uh, did not go down significantly. Then uh, we compare trust in the national versus the European Parliament. Uh, here it's important to look at the level, not just at uh, the changes over time. Uh, and what the data reveal is uh, that uh, in general, uh, if you look at the levels, the countries, so here the, the red line is one. So observations above, above one 
mean that uh, uh, there is more trust in the European than in the national institution. And what this picture tells you is, first of all, that southern European countries have more trust in uh, uh, the European than in the national parliament. Northern European countries, the opposite. This is not surprising, and, and this correlates well with the perceptions of, on the functioning of these institutions. So when domestic institutions are perceived as not being functioning very well, you trust them less than the European institutions, and vice versa. And, and for this reason, there is no obvious uh, pattern here over time in uh, this ratio. Uh, there are also differences across regions, not just uh, uh, over time, uh, in uh, these attitudes, and that's what we exploit in this data. Here you see an example of uh, uh, the uh, uh, ratio in trust in the European versus national parliaments in different regions of Europe. Red means that you have less trust in the European than in the national. Green you have more trust in the European than in the national. The black are missing uh, in 2014 for uh, those two countries. And uh, finally, uh, we look at uh, the shares of votes uh, of anti-EU parties. This share has remained uh, below 30% on average throughout uh, the European Union. Uh, but again, there are important differences uh, across countries. Um, this is uh, the regional differences. Here, regions uh, are defined uh, more narrowly because of the availability of data. You see that recently, Italy uh, has uh, given a lot of room to these anti-EU parties. Um, and if you look at uh, the picture for France, it is very similar to the outcomes of the first ballot of the presidential elections. The reddish areas are those that voted, uh, 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 voted for Le Pen, and the greenish areas are those that voted for, for Macron. Uh, and over time, uh, you see that uh, there has been, since 2009, a very sharp increase in the share of the anti-EU parties uh, uh, almost everywhere, not in uh, uh, Sweden, not in Spain, uh, and uh, not in Belgium, but everywhere else, um, the anti-EU parties have, uh, have increased. But overall, uh, they have remained uh, below 30%, although in some countries, of course, they, they uh, are larger. Now, an important question is, uh, uh, the following. Did this increase in the vote share of anti-EU parties reflect a change in voting behavior, or does it reflect a change in the position of the parties? It could be that voters keep voting for the same parties, but now parties have become more anti-European. Now, to try and discriminate, in this picture we plotted the position coded by these national ex experts of the two, sometimes three, main national parties. And uh, uh, as you see, uh, there is now uh, uh, on the vertical axis, we measure being pro-Europe. Okay, so higher values means you're more pro-Europe. And uh, uh, what you take from this picture is that the main parties did not change their position towards the EU in a significant way. So the rise in anti-EU vote shares mainly comes from voters switching to parties that have a, a more stronger anti-EU platform compared to uh, the mainstream parties in general. There may be exceptions, the UK may be one of them, but uh, in general uh, that's uh, uh, the situation. Then we look at uh, the correlations between these uh, outcomes attitudes towards uh, national and European parliaments and vote shares with uh, available observations. Uh, the survey data, we correlate them with uh, individual features like age, gender, education, and so on. We look at the correlation with regional shocks, uh, regional unemployment and GDP per capita, and we also study the interaction between these regional shocks 
and the cultural traits of the region measured at the beginning of our sample, measured in the year 2000. Uh, and in particular, we measure traits that can be classified as either authoritarian or, or liberal. And we study if uh, the shocks uh, uh, had different effects in uh, uh, different regions controlling for their uh, cultural features. Now, what do the correlations say? When it comes to individual features, a very strong uh, finding is uh, that uh, uh, education and age are two very important, and, and being in a rural environment, are three very important discriminating, fe discriminating features. The older, the less educated, and the more rural individuals uh, have less trust in uh, these political institutions, whether national or European, um, and have uh, and more skeptical towards the European integration. And this is uh, true for uh, all, all countries. Uh, and uh, here you see uh, an example of, uh, of this uh, in this table. Uh, for the variable European integration, the same findings would apply to the other dimensions. Each column correspond to a different classification. Towards the right, you have the old uh, and the less educated. Towards the left, you have the younger and better educated. And as you move from uh, right to left, uh, the support and the trust towards these institutions increases. Now, uh, education and, and rural environment is not surprising. Age, perhaps, uh, would have, uh, it wasn't clear to us when we looked at, uh, at this. Uh, the story is often told that um, uh, elder individuals are more staunchly pro-European because they have a vivid memory of the war. Uh, and here, this suggests that uh, uh, it is actually not the case. It's the younger who are more pro-European. Unfortunately, we cannot discriminate on whether this is a cohort effect or an age effect. Uh, if we interpret it to be a cohort effect, uh, we should be optimistic, but it could be an age effect, in which case uh, these uh, young pro-Europeans will become a bit more skeptical as they age. Um, then we uh, control for, uh, uh, we look at the correlation with the macroeconomic shocks matching these uh, outcomes uh, with uh, uh, the macroeconomic variables in the region, always controlling for the individual features and also controlling for region and period fixed effects, which means that the correlations that we capture uh, reflect uh, the time series correlation, so the correlation over time between the dependent variable, survey data, or voting outcome, and the macro, uh, the macro variables, um, and the idiosyncratic regional macro variables. And we find the following, that there is a very strong and robust and large negative correlation between these macro shocks, these macro variables, and uh, uh, trust in the national parliament. When the regional economy deteriorates, there is a drop in trust towards national parliament. There is also a, a, a negative, a similar correlation when you look at trust towards uh, European parliament and when you look at the anti-EU vote shares. When the economy deteriorates, you lose trust also in the European Union. You also observe a rise in the vote share of anti-EU parties. However, in the case of these last two variables, the vote shares and the, the trust in the European Parliament, the correlations are much smaller in magnitude. Um, in particular, uh, in uh, uh, the table that maybe you cannot see, but uh, is uh, reproducing the estimates, uh, the magnitudes of these correlations are the following. Suppose that unemployment went up by one percentage point. Um, uh, how much can that explain of the loss in trust in national parliaments that we observed throughout this period, between 2002 and 2014? According to the estimates, 23% of this loss of trust 
uh, would be explained by a one percentage point uh, increase in unemployment if this correlation was uh, capturing a causal effect. Uh, and similarly, um, if uh, per capita income in the region goes down by one percent, that can account for about uh, one fifth of uh, the drop in trust in the period. So these are very large number given the severity of the recessions. Uh, however, the numbers are much smaller for the uh, vote shares of anti-EU parties and trust in the European uh, Parliament. Uh, uh, a one percent increase in unemployment uh, would reduce trust in the European Parliament by 4%, it would increase of the overall magnitude, the dropped, uh, and uh, uh, the vote share of anti-EU parties would change by a similar fraction, again, 4% of the overall increase in anti-EU parties. We also disaggregated the, the, the regions uh, and the shocks to see if there were heterogeneities in these responses. And the answer is that there are some heterogeneities. The correlation is stronger uh, in the recent crisis than in the previous business cycle events. So uh, after 2008, um, trust and vote shares are more sensitive to economic conditions in the regions. And the correlation tends to be stronger also for Southern Europe, particularly when it comes to trust towards the national parliament, where Southern Europe, of course, was uh, more severely hit by the crisis. Uh, finally, we ask whether the effects of these macro shocks uh, are dampened or amplified by the uh, cultural features of the region. Uh, and the answer is, to some extent, uh, they are, uh, in particular, uh, an authoritarian culture tends to amplify the effect of macro shocks. A liberal culture tends to dampen these effects. Uh, and uh, uh, this is particularly strong, uh, if I remember correctly, when it comes to trust towards the European Parliament. When it comes to vote shares, there is no big interaction between uh, uh, the culture and the, and the macro shocks. So this is what the correlations say, and let me then turn to Andre for uh, the concluding discussion about the implications. Thank you, uh, thank you, Guido. So, you know, what what do we make out of this uh, those findings, and you know, what exactly? How do we interpret uh, our own uh, our own findings? Um, I think you can read it in two different manners, uh, a positive and a less positive one. Uh, the more positive side is when you look at levels, uh, levels of trust uh, towards Europe, uh, whether towards the European Parliament, uh, towards Europe integration, uh, the share of votes for pro-European parties, in terms of level remains high. There are some differences across countries, but overall remains high. If you look at changes, and especially what happened uh, in, in the last period that, that we cover, 2014, uh, 2015, compared to the earlier period, uh, there uh, one does see a decline, uh, a decline of trust towards uh, European institutions, decline of trust towards European integration, and uh, at the national level, uh, national trust towards national parliament has been, as Guido said, the more affected by the macroeconomic outcomes, and that has been especially the case in, uh, in Southern Europe, obviously. So a mixed, uh, a mixed picture, but yet the levels remain sufficiently high that uh, our feeling is uh, that uh, there is no existential threat uh, for the EU, uh, at least uh, so far. Now, uh, there have also been, obviously, a, a number of positive developments uh, since uh, we had started our studies. I said that at, at the beginning that we started our study just after the uh, election of Trump in, in the U.S., but before a number of important elections in Europe. Now, the result of those elections, Austria, Netherlands, uh, France, has been uh, not uh, in favor, but against uh, the populist tide, and so one can, you know, conclude from that that the worst uh, has passed. Also, the worst of the economic crisis is behind us, 
And therefore, uh, looking at both the macroeconomic conditions and the sentiment uh, of voters, it seems that uh, one should uh, draw from or result a rather optimistic uh, conclusion. Now, what we, uh, what we say is that one should beware of, of complacency. Uh, you know, it would be the natural uh, tendency, but I think there are a number of factors that we feel uh, should uh, warn us against uh, complacency. One is that uh, Brexit, which was feared a year ago, as would lead to uh, equivalent results in, in other countries, and that has not happened, and quite on the contrary, it seems that Brexit uh, is rekindling the uh, pro-European sentiment on the, uh, on the continent. And yes, uh, from our studies, one, one can see, and from all the data that Guido showed, that the UK seems to be special in our sample of countries, and you know, no country you know, would be ready quite to follow uh, the UK situation. Nonetheless, some of the underlying factors, the socioeconomic factors that are underlying the uh, leave uh, vote, uh, they are present in many of the, uh, of the other countries. So one shouldn't think that this is just a UK or a US uh, phenomenon. So yes, there is a better, better environment today, but you know, some of the underlying causes uh, are there. The second is that we are talking about the EU here, and as we will discuss in a second, uh, we feel that there are a number of intrinsic fragilities in the EU uh, institutional uh, construction that make it liable to uh, to be careful about you know to be liable to attacks uh, from the populist and the third factor is that this divide at the national level that exists uh, between countries uh, between the north and the south uh, that has been the result of, of the crisis this divergence that has occurred uh, is there. And, uh, you know, although uh, everyone wants to, uh, to uh, close the gap, uh, this is not going to be uh, very, very simple. So, you know, let's, let's beware uh, that there are a, a number of, of problems that could still occur in the future, even though the current environment is, uh, is better. So let me say a few words about two, two of those factors, the socioeconomic factors and the, the EU uh, environment, institutional environment. On the socioeconomic factors, there's plenty of studies uh, that show that the uh, negative attitudes towards the EU, linked to, to age, uh, education, uh, residence, uh, urban versus rural, very much correlates with the attitude uh, towards uh, the future, how people apprehend uh, changes, globalization. So typically, uh, those that are more uh, optimistic uh, about the future, uh, about uh, the, the impact of globalization, how they perceive a technological change, whether it's an opportunity or whether it's a danger for them, uh, those people are much more optimistic. They tend also uh, to have a positive attitude towards the EU and vice versa. So to the extent that changes is going to to continue, and there's going to be dislocation coming from change, from globalization and technological change. Uh, again, this is not just a, a British phenomenon uh, everywhere uh, in Europe. Uh, one could register uh, ultimately uh, uh, EU uh, negative uh, attitude. Now, the, the, the intrinsic uh, fragility of, of the EU, uh, well, they are well known, uh, the problem of uh, input and output uh, legitimacy. I mean, that's, you know, in the political science uh, literature, there's always this discussion of legitimacy uh, of the EU. Now, if you think of the input legitimacy, the process, the political process, uh, we do have uh, a weakness, and the weakness uh, is related to two essential features uh, of the process of European integration. One is that there's a lack of what is called thick collective uh, identity. Uh, we do not have in Europe uh, that. We have a shallow uh, collective identity. We do have collective identity, but, but it is shallow. And we know that uh, we do not have a, a European <coughs> demos. So, sure, uh, we need to improve 
uh, the, uh, the process, the political process and the legitimacy, but we know that because of those difficulties, this is going to be difficult, this is going to be a long haul uh, process. And therefore, the other dimension of legitimacy, which is output legitimacy, uh, is so much more important in Europe than uh, in, uh, nation, in nation states, where the question of input legitimacy is not uh, so much present at all. Now, we are coming out of a crisis, not just the financial crisis, also the, uh, the refugee crisis, there are other uh, crises at, at our borders, and I think those crises have clearly contributed to uh, a sentiment on the part of, of citizens that uh, there is not sufficient output delivery uh, on the part of Europe, and therefore the, 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 the fall in the trust uh, is uh, associated to, to that. So, uh, we refrain in the report from making sort of big recommendations as to you know, whether one should reform the, the European social model, one should reform the euro, we should reform uh, the migration policy. But what we called for certainly is uh, the fact that the EU uh, needs to give much greater priority to uh, deliver uh, on the output legitimacy front. Not that the input legitimacy is not important, not that one doesn't need to, to, to improve the legitimacy of the, the political system, but again, because it's difficult, uh, one needs to emphasize the, uh, the output uh, legitimacy. Now, we warn also that uh, although uh, the six of us, the authors, uh, are economists, uh, we feel that, uh, obviously, for citizens, uh, what matters is not just the output legitimacy in terms of the economics uh, dimension uh, and the economic security. Uh, there are also a number of non-economic security uh, elements that are crucial to what citizens are expecting uh, from Europe. And if you look uh, at those results from uh, the last uh, Eurobarometer uh, from this year, where uh, citizens throughout Europe were asked uh, which are the areas where current EU action is judged to be insufficient or areas where uh, the EU in the view of citizens should intervene more uh, than currently, there is an, an economic dimension and unemployment is always uh, very present, but there are also uh, non-economic uh, issues, in particular uh, migration and uh, external, uh, external security and, and, uh, and terrorism. So uh, our conclusion is that uh, Europe uh, has uh, its work uh, cut out uh, for itself. Uh, first and foremost, improve uh, uh, output legitimacy, uh, but uh, don't forget about input legitimacy. Uh, when we read the, uh, the Rome Declaration by heads of states and government uh, celebrating the, uh, the 60th anniversary uh, of the Treaty of Rome, uh, we were somewhat reassured that heads of states did realize that indeed Europe is facing a legitimacy problem, uh, both in terms of input and output. And, uh, but that heads of states did pledge uh, that they would uh, repair that. And so uh, we concluded our report with sort of cautious optimism. You know, the situation is not as bad as we had feared it would be. Uh, the environment is, uh, is better now than it was when we started our study. Uh, there's been a decline of trust, but levels are still relatively comfortable. There seems to be a political awareness uh, that one needs to, to repair the situation. And because the economic conditions and the trust uh, towards Europe seems to be improving now, there is indeed this window of opportunity that uh, President Juncker uh, has been talking about. And let's hope that indeed it will be seized and that uh, legitimacy will improve and trust in institutions uh, will improve and therefore populism, if not go away, will uh, not be a uh, burning issue for Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, André and, uh, and Guido, for, uh, for the presentation. It's a lot of food for thought, yeah. <laughs> which I'm uh, looking at Maria uh, for first reaction and commentary uh, on this. Maria. Okay, thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe. And uh, very many thanks to both Guido and, and André for agreeing to come to Bruegel to present uh, this, this uh, excellent piece of work. Uh, I think I probably speak for all of us when I say that uh, you know, research on these types of issues are crucial. Uh, certainly in a place like Brussels, where, you know, if we are wanting to advance with this project of monetary union and the EU in more general, um, the issue of trust is pivotal. Um, indeed, uh, as Giuseppe just said, and as you all saw, there is a lot in this report. Um, and all of it is uh, extremely interesting, so it's a bit difficult to, to pick on what to, uh, to comment. Um, and if I don't uh, discuss a few things, it doesn't mean that I don't think they're interesting. It's just that, you know, I feel that I have to add or perhaps criticize or whatever on only a few issues. So I will, I will pick on a few results uh, and then perhaps make, maybe make a couple of general remarks. Um, I, I have no trouble uh, believing your result that um, trust and populism correlate. I think that's, uh, that, that, you know, it's very reassuring to see that, but it's also extremely troubling. So that means that as we see the surge of populism, at the same time, we're losing trust. So, and, you know, populism and nationalism are two concepts that are not very far from each other, uh, even though they could be from difficult, di different ends of the political spectrum, but they could actually correlate. And that in itself is very worrying. Um, uh, but I think you're right. It is, it, is, uh, it is something that has been one of the causal issues in the erosion of trust in Europe, on the national governments, but also on the European, on the European institutions. So let me, let me uh, pick on a few of your results and discuss uh, some of the, the way that I read some of your results. Uh, on, on slide nine, uh, which is the results on the evolution of trust in the European Parliament, um, uh, you know, it's very difficult to really just look on the very first graph, which is all countries. It's more interesting to look at the countries themselves, because as you see, the, the, the story is not the same in all countries. And it's interesting to understand why it's not the same in all um, countries. Um, as you can see, that the trust in, in all countries uh, is lower now than what it was at the beginning of the century. Uh, I think you started 2002. Uh, in all countries, with one exception, that is Sweden. And that's interesting. Why Sweden? I mean, in fact, the, the, the trend in Sweden is extremely interesting. Uh, so there's been an increase in the trust of European institutions in Sweden. That's, that's one interesting thing to, to look at. Um, in a number of countries, um, the decline of trust is really a result of the crisis. So you see a flattening it out of trust, and then there is really a collapse. And countries like Spain, Finland, France, and Ireland fit the scenario. So there's flattening, and then you have a crisis effect. So there you see a very clear story. There was nothing before that, but it really is a crisis thing. And one of the ways that the crisis manifests itself is in a collapse of, of trust in the European institutions. But it's not the story for all countries. And that in itself is quite interesting. You have uh, other, another, another set of countries where you see that the decline is steady. It had started a lot earlier. And here you have Greece, Portugal, Austria, and the UK. Um, the UK is not there, but it is in your, in your uh, in, in, somehow you skipped here. Uh, and it has a very similar story there. There is a very steady decline of trust that started uh, a lot before uh, the crisis. Um, so there, that is a first signal that there is something going on that goes beyond the crisis. Right? It has to do more with, the, with, the, with Europe itself than it has to do with the crisis. But obviously, you, you see the slopes, even in this country, deteriorating as soon as we hit the crisis. Yeah, so there is a really a sort of a speed up of the, of, of the process, whatever that process may be. So that's on the European, on the European side. On your slide 11, if you can, if you can uh, put slide 11 on, which is the same, but now for the national uh, graphs, um, you make the interesting, uh, the interesting conclusion, you draw the conclusion that the decline in national parliaments is primarily due to uh, uh, the financial crisis. So you see the declines mostly in those countries that were hit by the financial crisis. I think the story is slightly more granular in this respect. And I would like to pick on the Holland here simply because I happen to know it a little bit better. The Netherlands was hit very hard by the crisis, but you don't see the decline in the, in the trust. If anything, you see an, an increase first and then a flattening it out. The small reduction that you see will not be statistically significant. So you really see that uh, the, the decline in the, uh, in the national um, uh, institutions did not happen in the Netherlands, even though it was hit very bad by, by the crisis. And that's the case for most countries. So really, I would, I would argue that the, the reason why you didn't see that is not so much the crisis itself, but it is the willingness, and more importantly, the ability to react to the crisis. So those countries that had the buffer, so they had the institution and they had the money, if you like, 
They had created buffers prior to the crisis and therefore had the ability to buy the banks back and to sort of, you know, stimulate the economy. They did that very effectively um, and, and as a result did not lose, uh, the, the, the electorate did not lose, um, uh, did not lose trust in them. And, you know, while I was thinking here, or while I was looking at this graph, and particularly the Germany is, is a very interesting country here. I mean, if you look at Germany, the numbers are increasing, particularly after the crisis. So I was wondering whether the trust, I mean, I'm, I'm speculating here, but I was wondering if trust is not just an absolute, uh, it's not about absolute outcomes, but it's about relative outcomes as well, in the sense that it's not that we're doing well, it's that we're doing better than others. And in particularly Germany, you would see that actually this was one of the reasons why Germany actually reacted much better in terms of coming, coming back uh, from a shock that actually was very similar. I think the dip, the first, the first dip in 2009 in Germany was very similar to all the countries. It's just that they were a lot more effective and better than other countries. So, you know, this sharp increase in the trust of institutions uh, could very well be because it happened to do much better than anybody else. Um, now, I was very interested in the next uh, in the next result also, where you could where you have the ratios. I think the ratios are, are very interesting. Uh, um, and and your, I mean, I agree with your uh, general conclusion that the tr that southern countries lost a lot more trust in the national institutions than the European ones, and the other way around. Northern countries, and here the the UK is included in that group. Uh, they lost more trust in the European institutions than they lost in the national institutions. That's a very interesting result. And, and it's, I think it has always been the case that the southern countries, at least in my view, have used the EU as an anchor, and as an anchor for improving their institutions. So that you're starting from a much lower point, so it's a lot easier to lose confidence in, in those institutions. But it also points to something that I had always believed, that when we had this discussion, I mean, the threat of exits, Brexit, Brexit, we were talking, there was a period where there was a lot of these exits in the conversation. I had always thought that if this threat were ever going to be materialized, it would not materialize from the southern countries, it would materialize from the northern countries, precisely for that reason. Uh, because they are the ones who believe in European institutions a lot less than the southern countries. So, you know, this is not how we, uh, we, uh, dis we, uh, we discuss it and the other discussion happens. And here, Italy is quite interesting. I think Italy, you see an increase in the ratio, right? But it is very confusing that is increased because both of the trusts are decreasing. It's just that they are decreasing a lot faster for national institutions than they are decreasing for the European institutions. So I think that graph, uh, Italy is very, is, is an outlier here. But I really don't think that there is a huge search for Europeanness in Italy. It's just that the, the, the speeds at which both are reducing diverge. And I think that's, that's kind of an interesting story. Now, I can't help but say something about one of the arguments you used, uh, Andre, in your, particularly in your, in your last uh, intervention, about uh, the stocks and the flows. Um, I mean, you know, trust is a, is a zero one variable, right? It's a binary variable. You either have it or you don't. I either trust you or I don't trust you. However, you build up, uh, you build up trust, and therefore it's important to look at it as a flow as well, right? Now, what these graphs are telling us, the two previous ones and this one, is a lot more about the direction of move than they're telling us about how much trust do we have. And it's very difficult. I mean, the subsequent parts of the paper try to identify bits to that, but you don't get much of a feel of where the threshold is. And you, know, you just need to look, if you go back to the, set, to the previous slides, you need to look at the, the numbers. The numbers are never very big. On a zero one variable, they are between 0 0.4 and 0 0.5. And I can't help but asking, you know, what is the sufficiency conditions here? I mean, you know, at what point can I say, now this, my trust is sufficient and therefore, you know, therefore I proceed, or my trust is not sufficient and therefore, question mark, therefore what? Um, and, and, you know, I think it's important to discuss this. I mean, some of the numbers are really, and I'll quote a few examples just to show you that there are differences, but I don't get a feel as to what is sufficient. A country like Greece, a country which is one, on the, one of the extremes of the spectrum, we had started with a 0 0.5 on both European and national institutions, and that was very comparable in 2002 with all the rest of, of the countries in your sample, but then it plummeted and it's currently at 0 0.2 on both, both institutions, the national and the Europeans. Um, so can I say that the state of trust to the European institutions was there at 2002? It's just that we lost it? Or can I say, well, I mean, it's just that it's reduced now, but I don't know whether it's sufficient. I don't even know whether it ever was sufficient. Um, and then you have Sweden on the other side of the spectrum, which is, of course, interesting in itself. It's now at 0 0.65. Is that sufficient? Can I then argue that the Swedish electorate has sufficient trust in European and national institutions and therefore can proceed more peacefully, as it were? 
I think that's crucial in the story, to talk about sufficiency and thresholds. It's something that I had actually done in, in some previous work where I tried, but I asked the same question, but this time for credibility of central banks. It's a very similar thing on a zero one, one is fully credible, zero is not credible, but what's enough? Right, and there in that work, I had found that that number needs to be very close to one. It's about 0 0.9 before I can say that, oh, now I have sufficient credibility that will let, allow me to achieve good results, right? And what's interesting also, and I think it's also important here, is to show that these thresholds, they exist, but they're neither constant nor are they exogenous, right? So you see, they're crucial not only to be defining the concept of trust, but also defining the switch points the points which are affected by all that we do. So I think that's an important story. And, and, and I missed that a little bit in the, in the report, even though I think you, you make a fair attempt after the, the, in the second half, if you like, of this report to say something about the sufficiency, uh, but in a different methodology, if you like, which doesn't necessarily connect with the first part. Um, okay. Um, and then some, some other thoughts. Uh, uh, by the way, it's not an easy exercise, what I'm asking. Um, but I think it's an important one so that you can really establish the fact that, you know, we do have trust. It's just that we need to deliver. And here I agree entirely with you. The issue of the output legitimacy is the one that we need to work on. Um, then again, some more thought, general thoughts um, on the macro shocks and how they matter. Naturally, they do. Trust, in my view, depends on three things. The first one is trust itself. So the previous levels of trust. If we are trustworthy, it's easier to maintain our trust. Right? So in the, if we are somebody who you can trust, at the first problem, you're not going to lose trust. It will take a lot more before you lose that trust. So buffers of trust, if you like, in that stock scenario are crucial. Then it's luck. If you have good circumstances, you're not being tested. And therefore, it's a lot easier to build credibility and trust. Right? And that's where the macroeconomic shocks come in. Good shocks would not challenge the credibility and the trust of institutions. Bad shocks will challenge the credibility of institutions. And the third one is policy. What policy does, how policy reacts. Is it effective? Is it quick? Is it timely? All of things matter. We saw it in Germany, how effective it was. Quick action and effective action really helped in building up trust in the institutions. All three matter. The, the, the macro shocks is just one of them. And I would put it down to luck, because the financial crisis is not something that we could have predicted, at least. Uh, well, at least we, we call this an exogenous shock. Um, and then I can't help say something about the generational difference. I think it's almost, it's almost an interesting thing. I mean, Guido, you, you said that it was constantly counterintuitive. Counter I've even listened to the, um, the podcast in Vox where your, your, your other author, Barry Akingri, makes exactly the same point, where we typically associate the older generation with the pro-European generation simply because they have vivid memories of the war. I think you're thinking of the very old, actually. <laughs> I, 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 th I think things are a little bit different. Uh, Richard. The, the, the old uh, in this context are the, the old in, are the ones who in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s were contributing to this process, the successes of the process and the failures of the process, and the other ones who, in my view, are more likely to be disenfranchised by the process itself. Uh, so I think I'm not surprised at all. And remember, the young are the, 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 young are the Erasmus generation, right? They are the ones who try travel to the world of Europe, I, I, the other day somebody quoted them to me as the Ryanair generation. They just hop into the airplane and go and have friends everywhere. They are the ones who lose out. They lose their friendships. So I, for me, these results, both in, in your analysis and in the Brexit result, which is consistent, uh, is, is not counterintuitive at all. Uh, I find that uh, very, uh, very believable. Um, and then just one final, a little bit provocative uh, question, but if I may. Um, if your intention was to identify the uh, European population's trust in Europe, and by Europe I mean the project Europe, is the European Parliament the right institution to be asking them about? I mean, or could you could you think of other institutions? Or how would you form? I know that you use the word integration, but just asking people whether they have trust in their European Parliament is that that, that, that all, is it the same thing? Mm -hmm. Um, as asking them whether they believe in the project of Europe. I'll stop here and let our public pick up uh, other questions. Thank you. Th thank you, Maria. Indeed, uh, yeah, a, lot of, uh, a lot of reactions, a lot of comments. Uh, and um, just one thing before I give the floor for a quick uh, uh, com commentaire show, as we would say uh, in French. Uh, since you mentioned the issue of the age, I, I had also an, a question about the, the use of the age as a metric 
Uh, I was thinking about, uh, one, from one side, there is the age of the voters and, uh, and, and their uh, political preferences. The other end, there is the age of the militants, candidates, party leaders uh, of populist parties. And uh, at least in the few couple of years, I have to say at least case of Italy, which I, I know best, I can see that uh, the the candidates of, of populist parties, they are rather young. And even if we look at the, at the base in Front National, I don't know exactly, but it will be interesting uh, to, have, uh, to have a look at about not only the ones that they are, but the, is, are those populist movements composed by old people or they are composed by young people? And maybe the results might be very granular and they can say something else about the story of the age. But thank you. Uh, th thank you very much for, for uh, your thoughtful uh, comments. And I personally uh, agree with many of, of the remarks you made. So I'm just going to pick uh, those where I have something to add or, or to react to. Um, on uh, the point that you made that uh, uh, the trust in the national parliament reacts to relative uh, differences in performance and not just to absolute differences in performance. I think that's exactly right, but I think that's what our correlations capture in a sense, because we have ear fixed effects in the regression. So the correlations reflect uh, the changes in idiosyncratic shocks to the region. So shocks relative to the average uh, for, for the period. So that is consistent, I think, with uh, the findings, absolutely. Um, on how much trust uh, is sufficient, we don't know. But, but uh, let, let me emphasize that the trust as we measure is not a binary variable. It varies on a scale from 1 to 10 in the individual responses. Then we rescale it from 0 to 1. Uh, so it, it is not a binary variable. We could measure the intensity of trust. Uh, we still don't know how much uh, is enough. But if we take uh, the northern European countries as a benchmark of uh, very well-functioning democracies, in those countries, uh, on average, trust uh, is around 55, 60, 62, 63 percent. So that would be the upper end of uh, what it means to be trust uh, in a well-functioning democracy in, in our context. Uh, and uh, if you look at the levels in Greece, it's now 20 percent. So the differences in level are, are very stark. They are not captured by our analysis because we only look at the time series correlations, but they are there in the data. Um, uh, one point on what the term is trust, the lack or policy responses or what else, um, I think an important issue which is related to, to your remarks maybe is uh, whether these correlations are symmetric or asymmetric. In other words, uh, uh, we lost trust now. Are we going to regain it uh, if uh, the economy improves? Uh, that's, I think, a very important issue. Uh, and our analysis, as, as, as Dan cannot answer that question, but one ground for uh, skepticism or being careful about the fact that we are going to regain it is that there's been a discrete change in the political system now. Uh, we now have uh, new representatives and new parties that somehow represent uh, these disillusioned voters and maybe um, to the extent that these populist parties will remain successful in preserving these vote shares, uh, uh, that will be an obstacle in uh, regaining trust. So in the past, in the previous recoveries, perhaps it was easier to regain trust because the political system did not change uh, in this uh, significant way uh, that it has now. Um, on uh, uh, EU integration, in fact, one of the variables uh, that we have in the analysis, I think, does measure uh, what you wanted to measure, uh, trust in the European process, because it asks respondents uh, uh, whether they 
are in favor or more or less European integration. So in a sense, that goes to the heart, uh, and it, uh, uh, it does correlate uh, with these uh, macro shocks to some extent. But I guess the message, as Andre emphasized, is that uh, the, the business cycles are highly, very highly correlated with trust in national institutions. Uh, they are much less correlated with uh, these attitudes towards Europe, whether towards the European Parliament or European integration. Signific they are statistically significant, but they don't explain so much. So I think we, we can explain why the, uh, there was this uh, surge in populist cons cons towards populist parties at the national level, based on the size of, uh, of the loss of output and unemployment. Uh, but these economic shocks don't explain quantitatively much of the, this gradual erosion of trust in the European Parliament that you noted. Um, and uh, uh, probably we have to look uh, uh, maybe in, in, in economic issues, but not exactly in the same way as uh, uh, for national institutions. So voters. I think correctly, expect national politicians and national policies to protect them from adverse economic conditions. Uh, it's not obvious that they are blaming Europe to the same extent for these uh, adverse economic conditions, and, and maybe they, they are right in, uh, in doing so, which uh, suggests that the recovery not necessarily will uh, restore trust and confidence in the European project to the same extent as it would towards uh, national domestic institutions. Um, I don't know whether you wanted to add yeah, something. I, 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 would, I mean, I, I agree uh, with what you, you just said, uh, Guido, and I mean, I, your, your comments, I think, were very well, uh, very interesting and very well, uh, very well taken, including on this issue of thresholds. I mean, it's a very, very difficult issue to, uh, to handle, and we, we did not uh, try it. But l let me add a couple of points. Uh, one is about, um, first, the UK versus Italy here. Um, so to take a northern and a southern country, and you know, with this relationship of trust towards national parliament and uh, European parliament. <coughs> now, one element uh, that maybe we did not emphasize sufficiently in the, in the presentation, since, as I said, I mean, Brexit was one of the motivations of this study, you know, and to, to try to examine to what extent Brexit could uh, happen in, uh, in other countries. Uh, what I think is very clear is that if you look at sort of the succession of, of graphs and, and figures uh, that we have in the, uh, in the report, uh, there is a clear pattern, which is that the UK is an outlier here. Um, and uh, in a sense, if you, uh, if you were doing this study and, you know, you didn't know anything of, you know, what has happened, Brexit and thing, and, you know, you were being told, no, look at the study, and one country uh, has decided to leave the EU. Can you tell based on reading this report which country it is, I think you would have no problem finding that it is the UK. Okay. So, I mean, that's, a, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting factor. Now, does it mean that it cannot happen elsewhere? And uh, what does it mean for, that's a northern country, right, in that category of countries where there's more trust towards national parliament than European parliament. Okay. And as, as you said uh, rightly, Maria, in, in the southern countries, the EU and the EU institutions have been viewed typically as an anchor to a weak national system. Okay. Now, it's clear also that those are the countries where the crisis uh, has hit the worst. And when you look at Italy, Italy was a country where uh, indeed uh, trust towards European institutions was always very, very high, partly because trust towards national institutions is so low. Okay? So at least there was Europe that we can trust into. But recently we have found that the fall of trust uh, in, in Italy towards, towards Europe has been, has been quite severe. And I think that is 
uh, I think this is the country that in the study, I'm not uh, suggesting at all that uh, Italy is the next one to leave, but you can see that there is a flashpoint there. Uh, that among the countries uh, where this trust, you know, it's great to have trust, but then you can be disappointed indeed. And that seems to be the, uh, the situation in Italy. And so I would, I would suggest that you know, it's worth, uh, it's worth uh, looking uh, a bit further. The second thing looking forward that I think uh, we, will, we will need to do, and that's not for, for the immediate uh, future, uh, but you know, maybe in a year's time or something, uh, we are now a little less than two years uh, in front of the next European election in June 2019. Now, I think it would be great, and I, I hope we can do that, is to run our, our equations, put there the new numbers in terms of the macroeconomic conditions, because this is essentially right, this is what's changing here, not, not the structural variables, the age and all of those others, but the macroeconomic conditions. And what is it that our model is predicting for the results country by country that we have for the results of the European election. And then compare our prediction based on what would then be the macroeconomic conditions in 2019 at the time of the election with the outcome of the election. And I think that that, that, would, that would be quite something, you know, quite, quite useful to understand about trust. So yes, the macro can be isolated, but then what about the, uh, the other factors? Just, if I may, because I think and we should. May, uh, we'll open the floor. Just to think, so you made me think, Andre, when you when, uh, actually it could very well be that this is a reflection of uh, disappointment rather than trust. And that's not so easy to disentangle, really. I mean, I think that that, that that is an important point, particularly where you see a huge plummet in the southern European countries. Yeah. Is it really that they don't trust the institutions that are disappointed? And just a quick note on the, on, again, on these threshold things and uh, on the asymmetry. I, um, I'm a, I know, I know, I mean, I certainly believe that it's an asymmetric effect in the sense that it's nonlinear. But on top of that, the threshold itself is, is moving. And, uh, you know, the elections, as you say, the electoral, the composition of the electoral, uh, of the elections right now are going to be very different. It's going to be twice as hard to go over that threshold to the extent that we are below. So, yes, I, I, I agree with you entirely. So, we'd like to open the floor. I had already some questions from uh, Gregory here uh, in the front row and from Reinilde, and then I will take the others. Yeah, I have a few questions I'm going to. Very simple question. Um, during your presentation, you really focused on Western Europe. I wonder if in the, um, if in the study you also touch uh, to Eastern Europe, because we know that now there is some strong uh, anti-European sentiment in Poland, uh, and, uh, Hungary, etc. So I wonder if you, if you touch that, and if you don't, what, do you have some in intuition on, on those countries? I'll take a few questions before and then uh, collective reply. So let me first congratulate the authors for a very much uh, needed piece of uh, analysis. I have uh, three questions. So one is I was really struck by the fact that the classic parties are not changing too much despite the changes in, in trust here. And so most of the effects are really in the growth of the populist parties. But is that also not somehow correlated? Is it in those countries where the classic parties are moving the least that they create the most room for the populist uh, Party. So could that be a mechanism to explain why um, you get in some regions much more effects from, from the populists? Um, and then my second question was on, uh, so you, you have a correlation between trust and, and, and the growth of populist parties, but how exactly does the causation work? Is it because you have a loss in trust that these populist parties grow? Or is it also that these populist parties to somehow, to some extent also create a bit of lack of trust uh, here, irrespective of any hard evidence that there is on, on reasons to, to, to mistrust uh, here. And then that really to my third question is, so you have a change in these trusts, uh, and that's a, um, a score variable. So can you also identify whether that average drop in trust is a due be to the fact that those that were already least trusting drop further, and the others stay, or is it really on average a drop in? And so related to that is, is there a growing inequality in trust uh, here? So that it's really a hard core of non-trusters versus a very stable trust of, uh, group of trust. Thank you. I had one and to Scott and, uh, and then the person just behind you. Yeah. 
And then after I take a round of uh, replies, and then I will take a round of questions again. Thank you. Lars Hogart, formerly with the Commission. Andre, could you put up the slide with the uh, one where there was a deficit in terms of what the uh, public thought that the EU was doing? Yeah. It's uh, almost up back. Yeah, that, that's sorry. That's the one. Yeah. Uh, as far as I can see, there's not much of a difference between no. what is insufficient and what should be that's done right. more. Exactly. But my comment is that I think the key word is what you used as the EU needs to deliver, right? Uh, because that's the key to uh, sort of uh, having action against uh, the lack of trust and the lack of popularity. And, and these are the key elements. I mean, we're talking about unemployment, or we're talking about making sure that we have common borders, and those common borders are actually controlled, uh, immigration and all that, the illegal immigration, in environment, Social Europe, uh, recognition of brevet exams, uh, all these elements which are relevant for day-to-day -day, uh, people and they can understand that. So that's the key. Uh, it's all very good to talk about uh, per perhaps uh, institutional reforms or it's about treaty reforms and all that. I think that goes beyond what really interests the public. What is relevant is the delivery social Europe and all the rest that can actually make a difference for people's lives. In the case of Italy, I think what you can see is that suddenly some Berlusconi's party and others, they thought it was opportunistic to be critical versus the Europe. So before having a very pro-European, suddenly it was sort of in their interest to be more negative. I think that reflects very much on the population and also, of course, the austerity, which has been very tough on Italy, and only now it seems to be coming slowly out of, of, the, of the shadows. I think the case of Sweden, I'm not Swedish, I'm Danish, but I think the fact is that the trust in the European Parliament in Sweden was very low to begin with, <laughs> yeah. and so there wasn't perhaps that much uh, need to improve. And the Swedes actually have had some quite significant MEPs, like the wife of Karl Bildt, who have made a very positive uh, contribution and impression so I think that may explain to some extent the, the outlier Swede. Thank you. Scott? Well, in fact, my, my comment is going to be very much along the same lines. But first, let me commend the authors for a really lovely piece of work. Uh, I've been uh, quoting one of uh, Professor Tabellini's papers for years. I'm sort of a secret admirer. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you here at Bruegel. Um, but uh, my, my question quite simply comes back to uh, Andre's point about uh, legitimacy of output, and, and again, closely linked to what we just heard. Um, does the average man or woman in the street actually know what are the outputs on which the European Union should be judged? Right? For legitimacy of output, you have to be able to attribute the outputs to the party responsible for them. Uh, I sometimes get the feeling, being a little cynical, that the European Union is responsible for everything when things go badly and for nothing when they go right. So what can be done? Thank you. Thank you. I take a round of replies now. Um, OK, so shall I start? Uh, so um, on other EU countries, uh, we, you're right. We did not uh, study them here except in the very first part. Um, there are two recent papers that have just come out with a very similar approach. A paper by um, Elias Papayuanu and uh, uh, Jan Algan and some other co-authors that is coming out now in the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity, and the paper by Luigi Guizzo, Morelli, and some other co-authors that is uh, 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 instead circulating as an academic paper. These papers have very similar approaches, look at very similar data, but for a broader set of countries. Um, and they have very, very similar uh, um, findings. So my inference from that is that much of uh, uh, the descriptive part would also apply to a broader set of countries. But um, uh, in the sense that uh, the, the uh, downturn in economic activity is correlated with uh, the outcomes pretty much as we have seen uh, here. More than that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, to say. Uh, on the points that uh, Renilde raised, I think they're all very, very interesting. Uh, 
so the first question she asked is why did, didn't the mainstream party move to cover the demands of these populist voters? They seem not to have done that. And that's a great question. I don't know the answer. I think I can suggest, can think of two possible reasons. One is that uh, these populist voters are uh, asking for uh, um, uh, crazy things that cannot be delivered. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe that's true. Uh, the mainstream parties all shared uh, during the crisis responsibilities in government and they could not deliver. Uh, so that could be one answer. The other possibility uh, uh, is that they uh, did not want to deliver. Maybe uh, they could have presented younger candidates, as you pointed out, or more uh, uh, people outside of the establishment. Maybe they could have helped the outsiders rather than the insiders, and they chose not to do so because they had entrenched the interest inside the parties. So it's probably a mix, and maybe they also misjudged the threat of these populist parties. But with this data, we cannot tell. And I think the interesting question is really, uh, is it possible to provide uh, what these uh, populist voters demand, or are these populist voters really asking for things that, that are, are unfeasible? Uh, and I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, on uh, uh, the second question, whether is uh, uh, what is the causality between trust and populism, uh, I think we cannot sort uh, that out uh, with uh, with this data. Um, and uh, I imagine that uh, uh, my my intuition, uh, but it's a conjecture, is that causality is probably running on both sides. That. Uh, um, these, these populist parties are, are trying to signal that they are different by uh, uh, s uh, diffusing mistrust of existing institutions and appealing to the common people. And we have seen that, of course, in the 30s. It's a, it's a common strategy. Uh, but there is also an element of uh, dissatisfaction and disappointment with the corruption and, uh, and the establishment. Um, and uh, uh, your last point uh, was uh, who lost trust? Uh, and that, unfortunately, we cannot answer with this data because it's not a panel data. Uh, so we don't know whether, uh, where it's, it's coming from. Uh, on uh, the last point that was made, uh, what can be done uh, to regain legitimacy through output and maybe uh, what is uh, the EU held accountable for? Well, what, what these numbers are suggesting is that uh, the EU is not so sensitive, not, not held so much accountable for uh, uh, general economic conditions. Of course, it reflects that, but uh, that is very important for national uh, politicians, less so for, for Europe. So my answer is really what Macron suggested, that the EU should offer protection. I think that's the mission of the EU in light of uh, the grievances of voters. We should uh, show that we are effective, effective in protecting European citizens in this dangerous uh, uh, global world with terrorism, uh, external threats, uh, immigration, uh, and so on. Uh, there, I think, uh, the EU is really providing a global public good if it was effective, that is demanded and it's not so uh, conflictual. Uh, and uh, so the message of Macron, we should provide protection, not necessarily trade protection, but protection is my answer to your question. Andre, do you want to add something for yeah. the answers or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I want to add a, a couple of points. Maybe I start with the, the, last, uh, the last issue and, and you're starting to see why maybe we did not have some of those elements in our, in our conclusions. Um, I mean, it, w w what is clear, and I mean, the, 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 there is obviously a, a great temptation uh, when we are talking about input and output legitimacy, and it's true that we would we, we did put more emphasis on the output legitimacy, on, you know, on delivering 
um, and, uh, and focusing on things where you can deliver and actually delivering uh, versus input legitimacy. We, we do think it's important, huh? but it's true. Citizens don't care uh, about the internal thing, you know, how it's how the institutions are, are, are working. What I think they they, they care more is about uh, is about uh, is about delivery. Um, now, our study does not allow really. I mean, the kind of the kind of data analysis that we did does not allow to say anything specific, okay? And to tell, you know, uh, any policy makers, ah, clearly our study says that, you know, you should pay more attention to this versus that. And, you know, that's, uh, that, that's in a sense the limitation of, of our study. In that sense, it's, uh, it's more an analytical study than a policy study that guides uh, immediately policy, okay? I think it does guide general, uh, general framework, you know, do a better job. Uh, but not whether it's on migration, or whether it's on trade, on whether it's on terrorism, or, or on, on the euro. And I think that, that is a real question. Now, um, how should we relate this to um, Juncker's uh, speech? Uh, of last week. I mean, that will be present in, in everybody's mind. Uh, we, we, when the report uh, was produced, obviously Juncker has not yet pronounced his speech. We, we made a, uh, a connection to the, uh, to, the, to the summit, to the March summit in, in Rome, and you know, we said what I, what I indicated in, in my remarks. Now, obviously, uh, President Trump is in charge of the executive, has put forward, in a sense, a program for the next uh, 15 months. And there one can see, you know, what can this commission, that is to put forward proposal, where do they want to, uh, to put their political capital? Okay? Acknowledging, I think, and they are acknowledging, obviously, the fact that there is the type of problem uh, that we have uh, that we have identified. Um, now, I, I would say a couple of things about this. First is that uh, when I see the speech, which on the whole I found a, a nice speech, and I think that the speech has been well received in the press in uh, in general, uh, at least in the press that I have uh, that I have read. You know the uh, that was that was good, and you know is trying to seize the opportunity. There is clearly this window of opportunity. The situation is better. There is a demand on the part of citizens and realize that you know, there could be a, a more difficult situation ahead. So now use this time to, uh, to do certain things. First thing is that I'm, I'm slightly worried that the uh, agenda that he has put forward uh, in his proposal is very, very, very wide, very broad. Uh, he has a 10-point uh, agenda that covers everything uh, that one can imagine. And yes, I mean, uh, Europe has, has a lot of work to, to do, whether it's the digital agenda, whether it's the unemployment, whether it's terrorism, whether it's migration, whether it's, you know, all of those kind of issues, I mean, that probably citizens uh, care about. But uh, is the Commission going to be able to make bold proposal? Uh, in the next 15 months in all of those areas? The answer is no. And even less the fact that the Council and the Parliament, this Council and this Parliament, before the, the next European election, will be able to, to act on those. So uh, for my money, uh, I would have prepared in the sense that the speech did make a choice. Okay? And choice are politics. But here, in a sense, there was no choice being made. It's the euro, uh, it's migration, it's this, it's that. Uh, that, uh, that worries me, uh, that worries me a, a little bit. And the second issue is indeed uh, something that we have been discussing uh, quite a bit, I think in a sense in the group and, and with Guido, is the euro economic security, in a sense, versus this non-economic security that you, you have just talked about. I think that in itself is a huge debate. Uh, can we do both? Uh, and there, there's a lot of talk that you know, the euro uh, needs to be reinforced before the next crisis. Okay? Because 
economic crisis, financial crisis, they are part of the, uh, the reality. Right? They are not behind us. They will be crises in, in the future. And whether we believe that uh, the euro is well equipped, it's better equipped than it was before, but it's sufficiently equipped to deal with the future crisis, not clear. So one view is that this should be the priority. Right? Another view is that, no, uh, this is not really what citizens are, are waiting for now. They're waiting for something external. Um, I think that's a, that's a huge political choice. Uh, I don't see that discussion. In a sense, we are pretending that we don't need to, uh, to make the choice that we can, do, uh, we can do everything. Not sure about that. I just want to take uh, two last questions, but very, very short, like a uh, few seconds each. I have one and, uh, and two. Stravos and, uh, and then I'm sorry, but we are already at... Uh, 27, we need to close the event in uh, three minutes, so uh, it's very, very short. Yes, please. It counts a little bit. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thanks for the good study you have made, which uh, it uh, gives a kind of light for direction we can get. Uh, but uh, in the God we trust, uh, we believe that, uh, as you all know, economy cannot stand. The mistrust creates economical problems. And uh, in order this to be faced, you, you know, the last six months, we are uh, suggesting uh, through our speeches in uh, the Committee of Regions and the Economical and Social Committee that we have to find a way of communication with the populists, uh, as you are calling them, uh, in, order, in order they to participate in the problems we face. This is the solution. We cannot divide the citizens if we want to build uh, a trust, so that means also good, good economies, but we have uh, the citizens to unite them. This is difficult, but we can call them participate in, a, in the uh, citizens' level to all the problems we are facing today, even the immigration. This is our suggestion, because uh, uh, the, the results of the populism we see in, in, in the American administration elections. Because the American administration, which for our uh, thinking, it's a good thing for Europe, because it will give the potential to Europe to be independent and the Mediterranean together, uh, it's a result of populism. Our prediction is that the populistic movements uh, are going to be augmented and are going to have a bigger share on the uh, political electorate system. Uh, and um, because this is based in education, the populists, as you call them, and as a lady co uh, from Morocco uh, institution called uh, last week at a meeting we had about the MENA uh, territory with ambassadors on the SEPS, uh, she told that populism comes from the people. So the misinformation. I'm, I'm sorry, the, I have to say. Question. Yes, I'm, I'm, finishing, I'm finishing with the question. I'm finishing, really I'm finishing with the time. question. I have to have the ability. Yes. If you are democratic, if you are not, I can finish. <laughs> I, I say I'm very democratic. I say you can ask the question, but be short. Yes, you the know, question. You know. the que yes, the question. Uh, it comes because of this uh, misinformation and not good education of these citizens. Yesterday it was on the, uh, on the Academy of Sciences a discussion about uh, democracy in the, if it is democratic, the institutions of the European Union by a gentleman who spoke for two hours. And uh, the question is, what do you have to say uh, about this text? I'm going to read it on Francais. Uh, and uh, uh, it's about education. It's on admet que démocratique le fait que les magistratures soient attribuées par tirage au sort oligarchique le fait qu'elle soit pourvu par l'élection. Aristotle politique 4, eh, eh, there was no response from your regimes, which they are called democratic, and according to Aristotle, they are oligarchic. Thank you. Okay, Stravos? Yes. That's a question for you. <laughs> Let me be brief and very precise. I, I love the study. Especially for, for the weakness that you admitted that we don't know what is the output, we don't know how to explain what the citizens need. And, and my question is, it, it's revealing what is the process through which we are going to find out what the citizen needs? Because it's one thing for scholars like you or think, or think tanks like Bruegel to do the survey and have a supplementary study. But uh, I was in the U.S. for the last one year. They've seen what they call the Trump movement, the process through which the country 
the, the needs of the country or the wishes of the country elected the president for good or bad. So what is the process in Europe that the, the, the democratic process will tell what citizens want or more importantly what citizens need? Is this the election of the, the head of the commission? Is it the election of the European Parliament? So what is the process through which we will discover this output that the citizens need? Thank you. So on, on, this last, on this last point, uh, maybe one way to answer your, uh, your observation, to, to react to your observation is, uh, is the following, that uh, I think we tend to overestimate uh, the, the differences between countries relative to the differences within countries. I think Europeans are, are much more similar uh, in their wishes than uh, we deem they are. I think the differences between an average French citizen and an average uh, uh, Italian or German citizen are much smaller than the differences we observe within Italy, within France, within Germany. And what is lacking is, is, is precisely uh, a, a process of aggregating these preferences and allowing cross-border coalitions. So my answer to that would be that, that we need to abandon as much as possible a method of integration based on intergovernmental decision making and reinforcing European institutions. And that would uh, allow probably uh, and to have an answer to your question. So in that sense, the, uh, the, the speech uh, by the president of the commission moves in that direction. Of course, he's an advocate of, of this, but I think he's right in order to further proceed along the European integration, we need to strengthen uh, the European institutions and, uh, and uh, reduce uh, the identification with the member states and with the nation and strengthen identification with Europe, but one needs uh, uh, stronger political institutions uh, to achieve that. I don't know whether you want to add anything. Okay. Well, thank you very much then. If there is no... Uh, I invite you to collect the report if you didn't have it yet. There are some copies left and uh, uh, thanks a lot and uh, have a good afternoon. Bye.